What's good YouTube? Welcome back. Today it is Lazy Days Tubby and I'm back out here again on my solo channel doing some more extra credits, extra histories, content for you guys today. And it is some more Ibn Battuta's content for you and it is the Mad Sultan Extra History Part 3. I'm really looking forward to finding out what they've got in store for me today. They make some amazing content. It's comedy and it's quick action and very insightful for what they're trying to do. If you haven't already, head over to their page and it's in the description box down below. They make amazing content. If you're enjoying my reactions and looking forward to future content reactions, then like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, but we're going to jump straight into this one. Ibn Battuta and his wagon train have pitched their tents on a hill, waiting mm. to see sight of the royal caravan they wish to join. His train full of servants, enslaved people, and concubines has been waiting a long time. Then, dust on the horizon. We saw a vast city on the move, he wrote, with its inhabitants, with mosques and bazaars in it, the smokes of the kitchens rising in the air, for they cook while they march, and horse-drawn wagons transporting the people. Mm. He descends to meet Osbank Khan, ruler okay. of the Golden Horde. Hmm. When Ibn Battuta crossed the Black Sea and landed in Crimea, he'd soon realized he'd crossed into another world. Though the Khanate's state religion was Islam, the more European provinces of the empire were thoroughly Christian, filled with Russians and Ukrainians. And that meant red-haired people with blue eyes, who <laughs> ate pork and made evil noises by ringing their church bells. A sound mm. that terrified Ibn Battuta. But he soon passed out of the infidel. It's interesting to see from someone else's point of view the clash of cultures. Lance ...and entered the steppe, traveling for the first time by wagon rather than horse or camelback, joining a Mongol caravan in order to find the Khan and link up with the Silk Road to India. And mm. he found much to like about the hardy and competent Mongols, but also much that shocked him. Even the observant Muslims drank alcohol, for instance, arguing that the Quran forbade wine and wheat beer, but not millet beer or fermented mare's milk. <laughs> Sweet, delicious loopholes. These differences came into stark relief when he met Osbeg Khan, entering his huge gold-tiled tent and finding the ruler sitting on a silver throne flanked by four unveiled wives. In mm. fact, he was soon to learn that the Khan consulted his wives on matters of state in public and that upon entering a tent, ah. it was the Khan that stood until his wives were seated. Mongol society often treated women as near equals and powerful women held a position higher than less powerful men. This was very different from his native Morocco, where a leader's wives might privately wield influence, but were never seen in public. Ibn mm. Battuta spent Ramadan with the Khan, the visiting difference. and conversing with his wives, and becoming particularly close with the youngest, Princess Bayelan, whom he shared much in common, for she too was far from home and adrift in a strange culture, the daughter of the Byzantine emperor given away in a political marriage. Ibn Battuta sympathized, but okay. for different reasons. While he, he liked the Khan, who was a generous and able ruler, he disliked how the man drank, even showing up for afternoon prayer one day, stumbling drunk and nearly incomprehensible. Mm. But as a point of etiquette, after all of the gifts and hospitality the Khan had bestowed upon him, he really couldn't just drop the mic and bail on his latest patron. So instead, he asked the Khan if he could take, you guessed it, a side trip. Yeah. Because <laughs> was pregnant and got permission to have their baby at home in Constantinople. So, Ibn Battuta requested to accompany her, as it was the perfect opportunity to take said side trip, not just in safety, but in style. Mm. The request granted, Ibn Battuta set out with the princess's caravan, doubling she gets back to, go the to city another the place. Business, seeing the Hagia Sophia and meeting the emperor, marveling at the city's relative religious tolerance and touring the Golden Horn. But there was a. <laughs> <laughs> See, on the way back home, Princess Bayla had started throwing off the facade of Islamic conversion. And now it was clear that she wasn't coming home. This had been an escape plan. So Ibn Battuta had to turn around with the royal caravan, retrace his steps, and inform the Khan. Except mm. now it was winter on the steppe, and Ibn Battuta, a Moroccan, was not used to snow. It was so cold that they traveled along frozen rivers as if... So she's... she... So does her family back in Constantinople know that this is uh, an escape plan, is my question. Rose. So cold that when he washed his face with hot water, it froze in his beard. So cold that he wore three fur coats and so many layers of clothing underneath that that he had to be helped into the saddle. <laughs> the capital of the Khanate. And after presumably telling the Khan about his wife, because he never actually mentions the reaction, Ibn Battuta joined the trade caravans toward India. And this was some of the hardest traveling of his career. 
through mountains and dry country, and his recollections of it are confused and not specific. In eight months of relentless travel, he met the Khan of China. So what happened with Khan's wife there? I'm really interested in that. If you guys either have, well, let me know in the comments down box down below. But you, if you also have a video, please link it to me so that I can uh, react to that and check that out as well. Had a daughter and finally crossed through the Khyber Pass into India. They had to spread blankets in front of the camels so their feet would not sink in the deep snow. The Indian border authorities met him as he crossed into India, questioning okay. him about his intentions and qualifications, and telling him that should he wish to work for the Sultan, he must agree never to leave India except on official business. He agreed and signed a contract. Then... I'm very surprised that he's agreed to that, the fact that he can't leave. This man wants to go everywhere, clearly, and I think there's more side trips to come up. He took out a loan to buy the Sultan an appropriate gift of horses, gold, and enslaved people. Knowing the custom was to be granted an even larger gift in return. Yeah, he hadn't gone gold digging across three continents. <laughs> how this stuff worked. When the party arrived, Ibn Battuta was overawed. The Sultan's wooden palace, known as the Hall of a Thousand Pillars, was one of the largest structures he'd ever seen. Mm. Could it be that the rumors of the Sultan's splendor and generosity were not an exaggeration? Well, unfortunately, it would be a while before Ibn Battuta found out, because Muhammad Tughlaq, the Sultan of Delhi, was out crushing a rebellion. But in his absence, the Sultan's vizier accepted the gift and gave Ibn Battuta silk robes, a house, the tax revenue of two villages, which is 5,000 silver dinars a year for those of you keeping score at home, plus another 2,000 dinars as a starting bonus. Ibn Battuta was floored. He was what? part of Delhi's landed aristocracy, and he... <laughs> you imagine? Could you imagine? Ah, oh, mate. Tch. Lol, I wish I had all that power. He hadn't even been given a job yet. <laughs> it's got even wilder. Because the Sultan returned to Delhi in triumph, riding to the palace on a war elephant. Mm. The first in a great procession of armored beasts. And on... Now that would be a um, spectacle to see. You know, you never sort of seen it, and they're coming back from victory. The back of the mm. tournament was a huge basket of treasure and a catapult. Entranced, Ibn Battuta watched his men shoveled gold and silver coins into the machines and fired the treasure out into the celebrating crowd. And that's what <laughs> hit Ibn Battuta. This was a dream job. Coming here was a great idea. And this was only reinforced was it when though? he met the Sultan. And Muhammad Tughlaq liked the Moroccan so much that he made Ibn Battuta the Qadi of Delhi. And at this point, even Ibn Battuta was like, uh, thank you? But, you know, maybe that's too much. I mean, except for being a cadi on a caravan, I never had a real job or tried a case. And, you know, in fact, your religious law here is a bit different than the type I studied. Not to mention your court language is Persian, which I don't really speak well. So maybe we just let me work my way up? Huh? The Sultan told him not to worry. A <laughs> to do the real work and doubled his salary. Unusual, undoubtedly, but Ibn Battuta. There is a catch to all of this, and I can't wait to find out where it was is. Was about to find out that the Sultan of Delhi was a bit of an eccentric, you know, an unorthodox visionary. Some referred to him as mad. Mm. Early in his reign, he'd experimented with issuing copper coins backed by gold, but that scheme fell apart when Chinese traders wouldn't accept them. Then he decided to found a new capital and move his court to central India. And when the elites resisted, he used troops to force them. That too collapsed. And now, fearing the entrenched power blocks of the elites that hated him, the Sultan was hiring any foreigners that showed up so that they would be personally loyal to him, which was good, at least for Ibn Battuta. He became yeah. close with the Sultan, observing as the monarch, a religious scholar in his own right, invited Hindu and Jain holy men into the palace for religious debates. He even accompanied the monarch on military campaigns. Okay. At one point, the Sultan brought Ibn Battuta to see the Hindu yogis perform tricks, like mm. climbing a levitated rope, a performance that terrified the devout young scholar. But being a favorite was a financial problem. <laughs> Keeping up with the Sultan's lifestyle, the extravagant hunting trips, the constant gift giving, and hosting officials at his house actually put Ibn Battuta into debt. Mm. So that was problem number one. Problem number two was that the Sultan was a psychopath. Even Ibn Battuta, who often flattered his patrons, wrote, The Sultan was far too free in shedding blood. He used to punish small faults and great without respect of persons, whether they men of learning or piety or noble descent. Every day there are brought to the audience hall hundreds of people, chained, pinioned, and bettered, and they are executed, tortured, or beaten. 
killed advisors for disagreeing with him. Yeah, of course, that's, that's not uh, not in the way of Islam, right? He tortured holy men who refused to come to the palace. Particularly, he liked dropping red-hot squares of metal on victims' chests and ripping them off. And if he really hated someone, he'd throw them to his trained execution elephants, who would use the swords affixed to their tusks to play catch with the unfortunate victim. And perhaps that's when it hit Ibn Battuta, coming. Could you imagine? You just should get you just get thrown around between two elephants. Right, and they've got fucking sabers on their tusk, and you're just getting thrown around, and tossed about. No way, that's insane. That's insane. <laughs> just imagine little heads going like back and forth between two e elephants. That's so funny. I am looking forward to finding out what they've got in store for me for the next episode. This is a great little series. If you guys are enjoyed it and looking forward to the next one, then like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell. But I will catch you in the next video.